Thanks for staying until now, and I'd like to thank the um, organizers and Alan and Paul Allen for giving me the opportunity to participate in this um, you know, wonderful and inspiring symposium. And I don't know what you guys were thinking when you were watching this video from Stephen Smith, but I was thinking that maybe I should find a new job because <laughs> things <laughs> so complicated. <laughs> So um, the big question that I'm, I'm interested in is how we see. So how does the brain create a world of objects in space? And this is a side view of the macaque brain. And um, conceptually, object recognition involves two steps. First, the brain needs to extract a stable, compact, and explicit representation of the form stimulating the retina. And this is thought to be accomplished by the structure here, the inferior temporal lobe. And then the brain needs to compare the resulting representation to a stored representation in memory. And today I'll be um, telling you about the mechanisms for this first step. And um, the second step is accomplished by these medial temporal lobe structures that Christoph told you about yesterday. So we still know very little about how an object such as a flower, a bird, or even a simple square is actually represented in the brain. And I've been focusing on understanding how one specific form, that of a face, is represented. So we can detect and recognize faces with astonishing speed and accuracy. And um, Charles Gross first discovered the existence of face-selective cells in the inferior temporal lobe of um, monkeys in the late 70s. And here's an example. So this cell responds to this monkey face and to this human face, but not to the scrambled monkey face or to the hand. And um, these cells were reported to be distributed throughout IT cortex. And then in 1997, Nancy Kamwisher, using fMRI in humans, reported the discovery of an area in the human brain, an area that uh, responded selectively to faces. And um, you know, this was very interesting because it suggested that you know, these cells might actually be clustered into one single area. And um, naturally, um, everyone wanted to know what the cells in this region were actually doing. And you can't address that with fMRI because it's just measuring blood flow. So to tackle this question, um, I decided to scan monkeys and see if they had similar areas in their brains. So the monkeys were sitting in this horizontal chair, and they got juice um, inside the scanner for fixating. And we presented these six different categories of images of faces, bodies, fruits, gadgets, hands, and scramble patterns. And then we looked across the entire brain for regions that respond more to faces than to the non-face categories. And we've scanned uh, more than 16 monkeys by now on the stimulus, and in almost every single animal, we find um, these six patches of face selective cortex dist distributed along the temporal lobe. So one posterior patch, two middle patches, and three anterior patches. And here you can see the um, fMRI response time course from these six patches. So green is when the monkey was looking at faces, and um, orange when he was looking at the non-face patterns. And here you can see the consistency of the location of the patches across monkeys. So here are four different monkeys from posterior to anterior, and you can see how consistent the locations of the six patches are. And uh, recently we also found three patches of face selective cortex in the frontal lobe, so in orbital frontal cortex, in ventral lateral prefrontal cortex, and um, in the lower bank of the arcuate, suggesting that the system extends um, into the frontal lobe. And also, very recently, we found in a few animals um, a face selective patch in perirhinal cortex that could be important for coding face memories. Okay, so are each of these patches just processing faces independently, or do they actually form a connected system? So, to address this question, uh, Sebastian Muller in my lab did an experiment where he micro stimulated specific face patches inside the fMRI scanner um, while the monkey was just looking at a blank screen and then um, looked across the entire brain for other regions that were activated. And so here you can see the face patches for one monkey shown on these flat maps. Um, here they're shown in the green outlines. And here you can see um, an MRI image of the electrode going into this face patch. And there's the stimulation site on the flat map. And here's the comparison of activation um, during microstimulation versus activation during no microstimulation. Okay, so again, the monkey was looking at a blank screen the whole time, and we're stimulating at that region. And you can see that there's um, spread around the stimulation site plus these four discrete projections, which um, coincide with the other face patches. 
So this shows that the middle face patch on the lower lip, the STS, is connected to all five other temporal patches. And Sebastian repeated this experiment in each of the face patches. And in each case, what he found was that um, the face patch was strongly um, connected to the other face patches, but not to the surrounding cortex. So this shows that the system of patches really forms a um, unified system for face processing. And um, before I go on to tell you what the cells in each of these regions um, is doing, I want you to um, experience what it's like to have a lesion of your face patches. So here, if you look at this, right now your, your face patches are lesioned. <laughs> and now I'm going to reverse the lesion. So um, I really like this. And this works because, um, as I'll show you, the cells in the face patches are specialized for processing upright faces. And I really like this illusion because you know, our brain does such a good job of creating the seamless perception of objects. And you know, how it does that is a whole um, other research question. So that when we see a face, it's very hard for us to, to grasp you know, what is the contribution of V1 versus the um, higher order areas. But when you look at you know, these, these faces here, you can see the, um, you know, the color and the orientation all, and all the local features perfectly distinctly. And yet you can't um, grasp the expression and the um, distinctiveness of this face, because that's something that's computed by your higher order uh, face regions. OK, so what is this like to be the neurons in these patches? So to, to address this, um, we began in the middle face patch. And uh, we showed the same images that we showed in the fMRI experiment, these six categories of images. Um, but now, so they're presented foveally in ran random order. And now I'd like to show you a movie of one of the, um, of the responses of one cell from the middle face patch. So here, you'll see what the monkey saw, and um, you'll hear the clicks, which is the action potentials, fired by this neuron. Okay. So this is the response profile of the neuron that you just heard. And here, the first 16 images are on the faces. And we can represent this by the series of colored bars with red indicating excitation and blue indicating suppression. And here you can see the response profiles of all of the um, visually responsive neurons that we recorded from the middle face patch of two monkeys. And you can see at a glance that almost all of the cells were face selective. OK, so at least two of the six face patches appear to consist entirely of face selective cells. And um, this was very exciting um, for a number of reasons, but principally because I think um, it allowed us to overcome two of the um, biggest obstacles to understanding object recognition um, systematically, which are the huge cortical territory and the huge parameter space um, you know, for representing any arbitrary object. So now we can just focus on the face patches, and we can focus on this much more tractable space of faces. OK, so what is the mechanism for? Um, generating these face selective responses. To get at this, uh, we took advantage of cartoon faces because they can be easily parameterized into their different parts. And we use this cartoon face composed of these seven, di seven different parts, irises, eyebrows, eyes, nose, mouth, outline, and hair. And um, first, we confirmed that the cells actually do respond to the cartoon faces. So we generate these cartoon versions of the real faces. And here you can see the responses of a population of cells in the middle face patch to the 16 real faces, 16 um, non-face objects, 16 cartoon faces, and 16 cartoon face parts. And you can see that the response to the cartoon faces was about 80% that to the real faces. So the cells do treat the cartoon faces as faces. And then we presented all um, 2 to the 7th equals 128 combinations of these seven parts to each cell. And so we can represent each of these stimuli as this string of seven bits. And um, here you can see the response of one example neuron to these 128 stimuli. And you can see that this cell was very selective for the presence of hair, right, which are the first 64 stimuli. And here's a neighboring cell, which um, was very selective for the presence of irises and also for hair at short latencies. And here are two more cells with more complex um, selectivity patterns. So the basic story seems to be that different cells are integrating um, different constellations of face parts to detect a face. So now that the brain has detected a face, um, you know, how does it 
distinguish different faces. And in general terms, it could do so based on the outline of the face, uh, based on the shape of specific features, or based on the um, spatial relationship between features. And um, to distinguish these possibilities, again, we took advantage of cartoon faces, and we generated this cartoon face space um, consisting of 20 different dimensions, and each um, parameter could take one of 11 values, and some of the dimensions describe the overall shape of the face, like the aspect ratio. Some describe the shape of specific features, like the iris size, and some the uh, relationship between features, like inter-eye distance. And this is what the stimulus look like. Okay. And what we found was that different cells were tuned to um, different subsets of face parameters. Right? So here is um, an example of one cell and the tuning to the 19 different parameters. And you can see this cell <coughs> was um, significantly tuned to the face aspect ratio, the inter-eye distance, the eye aspect ratio, and the iris size. So it had a maximal response to large irises and minimal response to small irises. And um, as I showed, suggested earlier, the um, cells respond more strongly to upright than to inverted faces, and you can see that here. Um, this population of 43 cells, and this responds to 64 upright faces and 64 inverted versions of the same faces, and you can see that the invert response to the inverted faces is slower, it's weaker, and um, it's more transient than that to the upright faces. Okay, so how does, um, so far I've just told you about the response properties of cells in the two middle patches. How does the face selectivity develop as you go higher up in the hierarchy? So we next recorded from two anterior patches, a lip and AM. And I should say that when we micro-stimulated AM, it activated the prefrontal patches. Okay, so it seems to carry the final output of temporal lobe face processing. Um, here you can see the electrode descending into a lip and into AM. And uh, we repeated the exact same experiment in a lip that we did in the middle face patch. So we, um, every cell that we recorded, we showed it these um, 128 pictures of faces and other objects. And um, in a lip, surprisingly, we found that there seemed to be a much smaller percentage of face selective cells. There were many cells that didn't respond to any of the stimuli or were inhibited by faces. And this wasn't just because um, the face, you know, the face patches in this particular monkey were less face selective because we recorded from the middle face patch in the same monkey and um, repeated our previous ex results. Um, okay, so this raises a puzzle. How is it possible that ALIP has fewer face selective cells than its putative input, the middle face patch? And um, the answer to this puzzle became clear when we presented um, another stimulus set consisting of 25 different individuals at eight different head orientations. And here you can see the responses um, of more than 180 cells in ALIP to these 200 stimuli and they're sorted by the head orientation. So the first 25 stimuli were 25 different people all looking to the left and so on. And I hope you can see that there's basically two populations of cells in AL, one that likes straight up and downwards looking faces and one that likes leftward and rightward looking faces. And I should point out that this mirror symmetry is a new property of AL that we never observed in the middle face patch. Okay, so these cells that like profile faces were not activated by the frontal faces in our screening set, and that explains the puzzle in ALIP. So here's a movie of one of these profile selective cells from ALIP. So cells in ALIP are strongly view-tuned, and they um, exhibit this mirror symmetric tuning to profile views. So next, we um, put our electrode in the most anterior face patch in the temporal lobe. And um, again, we found that there was a smaller percentage of face selective cells than in the middle face patch. And again, this raised a puzzle. Um, and the answer to this puzzle um, also became clear with this set of 200 faces at different views, but in a different way. So here are the responses of AM cells to this stimulus set. And you can see that in AM, the cells are not strongly tuned to the head orientation, but instead there's a um, strong gradient in the overall responsiveness of the cells. And um, these cells up here responded very sparsely to only a few of these 200 stimuli. And I'd like to show you a movie of one of these sparsely responding AM cells. So I hope you see that this cell responds to only one person um, no matter which way he's looking. Okay. 
And I should point out that unlike the cells that Christoph described yesterday, um, the monkey did not know any of these people. So this seems to be a hardwired sparse representation of identity that's view invariant. Okay. And here you can see um, the response profile of one of these sparse AM cells to these 25 individuals with um, each head orientation coded by a different color. You can see this cell respond to only two people um, no matter which way they were looking. Okay, so in AM, many cells are sparsely tuned to face identity and often invariantly cross head orientation, size, and position. Um, so the distinction between these different face patches became especially clear when we computed these population correlation matrices. So here, um, this, in this 200 by 200 matrix, um, this voxel here represents the correlation between the population vector response to this face um, looking to the left and to this face also looking to the left. If you move up here, this entry corresponds to the um, population vector correlation between this face looking to the left and this face looking to the right. Okay. And the correlation is um, low, indicated by this entry's bright color. So in MLMF, what you see most prominently is this pattern of squares along the diagonal, indicating maximum similarity in the population response to faces looking in the same direction. Um, when you move to AL, what you see is that um, in addition to these squares along the diagonal, you see these squares here um, representing the correlation of the responses to mere symmetric views. And then very surprisingly to us, we also observed these um, diagonals within the squares. Right? And um, that means that the cells as a population are coding um, the face identity um, invariantly across a subset of views. Right? So you see that. And um, this was surprising because just listening to the neurons, we couldn't hear this um, invariant coding of identity. And then finally, in AM, um, I hope you see these diagonals extending across all the different views. So that means that in AM, as a population, um, face identity is coded in a fully view invariant way. OK, so I think. Um, our results suggest that there's a serial relationship between these three patches with AM at the apex. And um, so I hope it's clear that this system of face patches in the temporal and frontal lobes is going to help us enormously to understand the principles by which a complex object is represented because it breaks down this um, enormously complicated problem into these six plus three natural steps. So we can understand all the way from the most posterior face patch, which probably gets inputs corresponding to you know, spots and bars, um, how that gets elaborated all the way to the um, patches in the frontal cortex, which I suspect are um, coding the value of a face and indeed you know, of a person or another monkey, so we can understand the machinery for social cognition. And um, yeah, you know, one criticism I have of a lot of um, monkey electrophysiology studies is that they tell us about some interesting property of the cells in one area but they don't tell us anything about you know, how those properties arose or what happens afterwards. And I think with this system, uh, we have hope to um, hear the entire story. Um, so major open questions are, um, you know, how does the system develop in the first place? Uh, what is the um, direction and content of information flow between patches during different perceptual states? And related to that, you know, what is the contribution to perception of activity in each patch? And um, finally, and very importantly, how does the representation of identity in AM get read out by down, downstream areas, including memory areas, um, decision areas, like Mike Shadlin talked about yesterday, and reward areas. I'll just say a little bit more about these first two questions. So first, how does this system develop? Um, so as you probably all know, um, you know, babies and also monkey babies uh, have a preference for looking at faces um, from the moment they're, that they're born, you know, even if they've never seen a face before. And this is a movie of a um, one-day-old macaque monkey. And that suggests that there's a strong genetic um, component to specifying this um, specialized system for processing faces. And in humans, Brad Duchesne showed that um, developmental prosopagnosia is strongly heritable. So here you can see a family of, um, in which each of the black um, symbols represents a face-blind person. And also, um, when he analyzed the face recognition capabilities of mono um, zygotic versus dizygotic twins, you know, the correlation was 0.7 compared to 0.3. So all this suggests that there really might be some um, genetic component to specifying the system, and it would be, you know, very interesting to look at the gene expression inside the face patches compared to neighboring um, regions of cortex. And see. 
and um, finally looking to the future, you know, what is the information flow between the patches? So here is the local field potential response in the middle face patch to faces and to other objects. And you can see two um, troughs at 130 milliseconds and 200 milliseconds. And if you compare the time course of the LFP to the time course of the spiking activity, you can see that the first wave correlates with a um, rise in activity, and the second wave correlates with a um, decrease in activity. And since we know that um, feed-forward projections are excitatory, whereas feedback and local processing can contain a mixture of excitation and inhibition, um, it's possible that this first wave corresponds to the feed-forward input, and the second wave corresponds to feedback and local processing. And you know, the size of the second wave suggests that the feedback and local processing could be very important. But this is all um, circumstantial, and so um, you know, my big goal now is to try to use all these um, you know, amazing tools that Ed Boyden and others have developed with uh, optogenetics to actually identify, um, record from, and perturb these different classes of projection neurons between the different patches. So we can really dissect what is the function of feedback versus feed forward projections. Okay. And um, so my wish list. Um, so you know, sticking electrodes to try to figure out, um, you know, find connected neurons is you know, highly invasive. And in monkeys, you have to be very careful to avoid the blood vessels to avoid causing stroke. And also, you know, sticking fiber optics is very invasive. So um, I think it'd be really great if there uh, could be um, a genetically engineered monkey that was um, expressing channels that could be activated non-invasively with 3D spatial specificity. And um, you know, we might be closer to this than to um, you know Sumu's dream because um, people are developing you know, methods with ultrasound to non-invasively activate the brain. And also, I think there was a paper um, talking about conjugating magnetic beads to trip channels so you could activate the cells with um, magnets. All right, so I'd like to thank everyone in my lab, especially uh, my longtime collaborator, Vinrick Freiwald, and thank you. <laughs>